No one lives forever. I'm not stupid, Lucius. No one lives forever. No one. And more often than not, no MMA record goes untarnished, especially if you are trying to fight your way to the top of the sport. It doesn't matter how dominant your last performance, if you're being called the GOAT, or if you have the best sponsorships to your name. If you don't chew Big Red, then f*** you. Nothing can stop that perfect O from being stolen away by the next hottest prospect, your bitter rival, or your own face-palming error. With a gargantuan rise often comes a dizzying fall, and today we are looking at those unbeatable fighters and the moment their perfect career went up in flames. Oh my God, help me! I'm Bailey in from MMA on point, and boom, Jocko is back. Guns are blazing and slinging that all natural energy boost. So you get your 10% off using the exclusive code MMA on point, and with that subscription, you get free shipping and you can stock up on your fuel over at jockofuel.com. It's the ultimate pre workout boost. Anyways, more on that later, but for now, here are the 10 most dramatic ways unbeaten fighters lost. Number 10, Chris Weidman. Having never done anything but wrestle his whole life, after just three months of BJJ training with Matt Serra, Chris Weidman won the East Coast Grappler's Quest tournament and all 13 wins were by submission. Yeah, that's not something a normal human does. Then he won the ADCC North American Championships in 2009 and boom, it was time for an MMA career. He finished all of his first three opponents in the first round, captured the Ring of Championship belt, defended it once and at just 4-0 was offered a UFC contract. He had minimal experience compared to the rest of the roster, but it didn't matter. Chris started dominating the division and in just three years went from a debuting prospect to a UFC world champion title contender. A contender that was put as a 2-1 underdog on the betting lines, can't blame them really. Anderson Silva was on a six-year unbeaten streak, but GSP predicted Weidman was a bad matchup and he'd finish him, and that's exactly what he did. Boom, second round KO. The rematch wasn't exactly definitive with Silva breaking his leg, but Chris went on to defend the belt twice, clearing the next two top contenders in Lyoto Machida and Vitor Belfort, and now was on a 13-0 streak and had all the tools to stay a dominant champion. But a rival had emerged in Luke Rockhold, the last strike force middleweight champion, and after kicking a few contenders in the head, it was time for East Coast versus West Coast and Weidman versus Rockhold. Both guys were world class and were also suffering pre-fight. Luke with a staph infection and was on antibiotics, and Chris was dealing with a fractured foot, which severely affected his ability to train cardio. The fight quickly became a grueling affair, with both men visibly suffering and slowing the more it wore on, and if you know, you know what happened next. In the third round, the All-American threw a spinning wheel kick, it missed, he got taken down, and beaten over and over until the horn sounded. It really should have been stopped there, but it wasn't. He was taken down immediately at the start of the fourth and once again battered. He refused to quit, but the ref had no choice after an ungodly amount of punishment. Luke was declared the new champion and took Weidman's O in the process. Number nine, Joanna Janjacek. Boogie Woman is coming for heroes! The Boogie Woman, ladies and gentlemen! Okay, that was a lot more scary at the time, but let's roll it back to the start. At 16, Joanna took up Muay Thai for fitness, and what started out as a fun after-work hobby turned into a career. And she went on to be one of the most accomplished women's Muay Thai practitioners of all time, winning the world championships at 57 kilograms in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Yeah, that's right, five years on the dot. Then she made the switch to MMA, and after just two years as a pro, and at 6-0, the UFC came calling. At the same time, The Ultimate Fighter Season 20 was just getting started, and the whole point of the show was to crown the women's first 115-pound strawweight champion. But existing competitors like Adelia and Jacek, even though they'd made their debuts, weren't in the competition. Perhaps they weren't comfortable making the weight consecutively. Who knows? Anyway, Carla Esparza won that show. She became the first women's 115-pound champion. Ioana had beaten Claudia Gadelia in a very close matchup at UFC on Fox Dos Santos vs. Miocic, and so she was given a title shot just three months later. It was a classic striker vs. wrestler matchup, and to everyone's surprise, the unknown Ioana came through and butchered the Cookie Monster claiming the title in the process. And this is where things got scary. Ioana was now 9-0 and she set about clearing out the division. She mauled Jessica Penne, out-precisioned Valerie Letourneau, and then managed to beat her rival Gedalia after their own season of The Ultimate Fighter. At this point, Ioana looked unstoppable, was calling herself the Boogie Woman, and were all pretty terrified of what she was going to do to her next opponent. She beat fellow Polish women and then undefeated Karolina Kowalkiewicz and then corralled the pile-driving powerhouse Jessica Andrade. But all the while, Rose Namajunas, who had been a favorite to win the show was making her way up the division. The two met at UFC 217. It was a massive night of fights with three titles on the line and the build-up was intense. Rose recited the Lord's Prayer and Joanna promised to put on a show. The fight started and after a feeling out process, Rose launched into a lead hook that sent Joanna to the canvas. It was dramatic to say the least. The crowd went insane. <laughs> was born and Ioana's undefeated 14-0 career and five title defenses came to an end. Number 8. Darren Till 
After the rise of Conor McGregor, it seemed anything was possible. It also seemed the UFC was on the hunt for their next European superstar. And along came Darren Till, who made his UFC debut at 12-0, but quickly racked up wins, and by his second year, rose to 15, ready to take that next step to greatness. So the UFC sent him to Poland to face a veteran in the division, Donald Cerrone. Till wasted no time taking the fight right to him and TKO'd him in the first round. No one could deny it was an impressive performance, even if Cowboy was coming off the back of two losses. Still, Till needed one more big-name win before he could be granted a title shot, and he received a true test in his hometown of Liverpool against the former title contender Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Great fight with two strikers, it was a technical affair, but Till got the nod, wasn't scared of anyone, and inevitably would receive his title shot. At this point, Darren was 17-0, that's a damn impressive record. He had a great striking pedigree, was a big guy, and a tricky southpaw. There was a lot going for the scouser, and at this point in time, he was England's next great title shot hope, and still is to me, damn it. It's still real to me, damn it! <laughs> he was booked against champion Tyron Woodley at UFC 228. T-Wood had been the champion for two years at this point, but odds makers had it as a pick and fight when the books closed. Either way, everyone expected a war for Tyron to be pushed like never before against a young contender, but sadly for Darren, he was only able to land one strike in the entire contest. Darren's takedown defense was tested from the opening bell, and he couldn't land anything on the feet. At the start of the second round, he was dropped by Woodley's signature right hand, pounded on the mat, and forced to tap to a dash check. It was about as dominant as you can get. Till's perfect record was broken, and the experience gap between the two was evident. Number 7. Cody Garbrandt no Love really is one of those special cases in MMA. He was just so damn good that he went from making his debut in January 2015 to fighting for a world championship in December 2016. Should change his name to No Time, really. And it was hard not to get behind him. The fans certainly did, and the UFC responded accordingly. He came into the UFC just 5-0, having only been pro for over two years. He did the breakthrough star play by TKOing Marcus Brimich in his debut, and then was set loose on the rest of the bantamweight division. Bantamweight certainly needed some star power and young blood, and the UFC got exactly what they wanted. After the first ever decision of his career over Henry Briones at UFC 189. He scored three finishes in the space of just seven months, all three in the first round. Two of them straight stone cold KOs and a TKO of Takeo Mizugaki in under one minute. This put Cody at 10 and 0. Out of nowhere, this colorful tattooed boxing KO artist with hands faster than USADA violation announcement had burst into the UFC, knocked everyone out, and was now calling out the champion Dominic Cruz, who his own camp team Alpha Male had a long history with. He got what he wanted, and at UFC 207, in one of the single greatest performances of all time, he scored the champion and realized he's dream of becoming a world champion himself. Still undefeated, of course, so the next logical step was to create a fight based around the rivalry that had blossomed between himself and TJ Dillashaw, a former training partner and friend. They did a season of tough, Cody snatched a snake, and they were booked to fight at UFC 217. Cruz had beaten TJ back to win his belt. Cody had blasted through Cruz. MMA math works, right? Wrong? No, it doesn't work ever. Undisputedly, two of the most talented modern-day martial artists did battle, though, and Cody dropped TJ at the end of the first round, but in the second, Dillashaw caught Cody with a head kick, started dropping punishment, and although Garbrandt was swinging back wildly, the snake found its kill shot, and just like that, the immortality of Cody was taken. Number 6. Paulo Costa the Eraser is another fighter who kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, unless you watch the Brazilian Ultimate Fighter, which, I mean, you might do, but I wouldn't call you a casual for skipping that one. Costa didn't even have that good of a time on the show and was known mainly as a jiu-jitsu guy, but after he made his UFC debut in March 2017 against Gareth McLellan and just absolutely obliterated him in one minute, it was a wonder why he ever tried to BJJ people in the first place. So he was seeing at 9-0 after a successful UFC debut. He got two more fights in 2017, two TKOs, and then another one against Uriah Hall. Make it 12-0 for the eraser. Combined with the sheer physical specimen he was, most people believed he was about to marauder his way to a world title. So the UFC needed to make a match in honor of the MMA gods, and they booked Costa against Yoel Romero in a title eliminator. The two savages beat each other for 15 minutes, and it was a close fight. No, a close war. But Costa won, moved to 13-0, and if Yoel couldn't stop him, well, most people thought no one could. But the champion Israel Adesanya welcomed the challenge the eraser bore, and after a heated back and forth, the octagon doors closed at UFC 253, with many fans fans thinking Costa would just walk Izzy down and unload kicks and punches until he couldn't stand, but quite the opposite happened. Adesanya kept the fight on the outside, kicked his leg over and over until he landed a series of hooks, dropped him, and finished him. Costa had looked like a flesh and body version of the Terminator against pretty much everyone he faced, but no part of that game plan worked against Izzy, and he lost his O in the process. Number 5. Shane Carwin 
Ooh, if you never got to see a Shane Carwin fight, you missed out. I know these days heavyweights are impressive, but Carwin was part of an era of the biggest men the planet had ever seen who just slammed into each other until one gave way. He'd been pro for just over two years before making his UFC debut at UFC 84. He picked up seven wins, all by finish, all in the first round. In fact, he'd only had 10 minutes of cage time total before he joined the promotion. And once he got to the UFC, he pretty much did the same thing. He KO'd everybody he was put against in the first round, sometimes in the first minute. Hi, I'm Shane Carwin. I'll be fighting you today. Bam, bam, bam. Okay, thank you. Who's next? He KO'd Gabriel Gonzaga at UFC 96 to bring his record to 11-0 and was given a shot at interim gold when he took on Frank Mir, who actually lasted longer than any opponent he'd faced so far, but 3 minutes and 48 seconds isn't really saying much, and he was also quite viciously KO'd. I mean, just give the man the title at this point. Who the hell wants to fight this guy? Oh, Brock Lesnar? Okay, sure, that works. It was quite possibly the most anticipated fight of all time, doesn't get much more dramatic than that, and at UFC 116, the cage door closed on Lesnar versus Carwin. Shane did to Brock what he'd done to every Everybody walked up to them, punched them in the face, and started teeing off with ground and pound. Brock somehow, and with some help maybe from the referee, survived, and Shane was absolutely exhausted after trying to put unconscious a fellow giant. Round two started, and Shane looked like he was underwater. Brock took him down and sunk in an arm triangle for the win. Impossibly, Carwin had been defeated, and Brock survived an onslaught that no other man on the planet had been able to. Number four, Brian Ortega. After Conor McGregor moved on from featherweight and the Blessed Express began steamrolling the rest of the division at 145, the UFC was desperate for some new challenges. But how about a 14-0 undefeated BJJ black belt with 10 finishes to his name? Sure, that works. Ortega joined the UFC in 2014 and just 8-0 and and began slowly making his way through the division. Every single one of his UFC contests ended with a submission or TKO and some of them were fights he was losing. I mean, he scored his first four wins by finishing the third round, which basically means at any point Ortega could slap on a sub and end the contest no matter how well you thought you were doing. Pretty entertaining stuff. After getting past Clay Guida and Hanato Moicano, he was 12-0. and 0. Not bad at all. He just needed some more big names to his resume. Cobb Swanson was next, and that ended in another sub. And finally, Frankie Edgar, who was supposed to fight for a title against Holloway, but he pulled out, so he took a fight against Brian instead and was finished for the first time in his career. At this point, Ortega was 14-0, and 0, had showed that no matter what, he was always dangerous, and his last three fights had seen him receive a performance bonus. Time for a title shot. And you know what? It was pretty good to see Max fighting someone not named Jose Aldo for a change. The two men went to war at UFC 231, and although Ortega stayed in the fight, Max put on an absolute striking clinic, breaking UFC records with strikes landed, even helping correct Brian's defense at one point. And at the end of the fourth round that saw Max lad 134 significant strikes, the doctor waved off the contest. It was all action, it was carnage, and Ortega's unbeatable run came to an end. Number three, Ronda Rousey. I know at this point the MMA community has memed Ronda to all hell, and let's face it, in some ways she hasn't helped herself, but I'm sure some of you were around for her initial rise in the UFC, and I have to say, she was pretty unbelievable. After judo competition in the Olympics, she transitioned to MMA, debuting in March 2011 and winning her first world title in March 2012 when she subbed Misha Tate for the Strike Force Women's Championship. She got to defend once before the UFC brought up Strike Force along with the women's division and crowned her the UFC bantamweight champion at just 6 and 0. The question was, with so much hype, exposure, and promise of greatness, could she keep the title? Hell yes was the answer to that one. She made it seven first round wins and seven first round R bars when she tapped Liz Carmouche at 157 and then took on the rest of the newly built 135 roster. Another R bar in the Tate rematch, a one minute dispatchment of the Olympic wrestler Sarah McMahon, a 16 second KO of the BJJ black belt Alexis Davis and a 14 second win over a hell marrying Kat Zingano. Then she flew to Brazil to fight Betch Cahaya and knocked her out in just 30 seconds. At this point, she'd been the UFC champion for three years, was 12 and 0 and had set a record with six title defenses, which is still yet to be beaten. Basically, she'd done everything she was supposed to, bring women's MMA to the mainstream. Holly Holm had made her UFC debut earlier that year, however, and given she was a multiple-time women's boxing champion training under Greg Jackson, fans, commentators, and media were discussing her versus Ronda and what it would look like. And eight months later, we got our wish as Holly was booked against Ronda at UFC 193 in front of the biggest UFC crowd ever. Holly counted all of her judo and clinch attempts and four striking exchanges on the feet, which she got the better of, and eventually landed a world-shattering head kick that flipped the women's MMA landscape upside down. The Mike Tyson, Ronda Rousey era had been uniquely dominant, but it was over now, as was her perfect 12-0 record. Number 2. Cain Velasquez Truly, I feel sorry for anyone who wasn't there to witness the initial rise of Cain Velasquez. He made his UFC debut when he was just 2-0 as a pro because this man was a complete animal, a savage. He just unrelentingly beat guys into a bloody pulp and people couldn't do so much as throw a punch back in return. His UFC debut against Brad Morris was savagery incarnate and that continued through all his performances. After just two years in the UFC, he'd managed to pick up six wins, just steamrolling his way through the roster. After he KO'd Big Nog at UFC 110 in just two minutes, everyone knew this guy was a future champion. 
heck, he was nothing like we'd ever seen before. After the big nog fight, Kane was sitting at 8-0 and, oh, and the UFC gave him what he wanted, a title shot against then-champion Brock Lesnar at UFC 121. Brock came out charging and even managed to take Kane down, but he popped right back up and the unrelenting pace Kane was so notorious for setting began wearing Brock down quickly, I might add, and eventually he succumbed to the pressure, the ground of pound, and the new UFC champion. A dream had been realized, Kane was 9-0 and, oh, and most were calling him the greatest heavyweight of all time. In fact, some still do. But another potential superstar named Junior Dos Santos had been KOing his way up the division, and so Kane's first title defense was booked at the first ever UFC fight night on Fox, on national TV, and with the largest live audience of all time, 5.7 million viewers. Everything was set up for quite possibly the greatest heavyweight fight of all time, with a massive viewership ready to consume some MMA for the first time, but JDS came out and KO'd Kane in just one minute. It's not like every fighter puts a massive stock on staying undefeated, but the illusion and his O had been broken. Number 1. Ben Askren I'm pretty sure you wouldn't be watching this video if you didn't already know what happened to Ben Askren and his perfect undefeated record, but let me give you a little background context as to how we got there. Ben has won gold at the Big 12 Wrestling Championships, gold at the NCAA Division I Championships, World Championships, US Championships, Pan American Championships. Basically, he's one of the most credentialed wrestlers to ever get into MMA. After one year as a pro and going 3-0, he joined Bellator in their 2010 Weltermate tournament. Despite being inexperienced and pretty much a nobody, he made it all the way to the final and won the title. Not bad for your first year in the sport. Now he was seven and defended the belt six times over the next three years, beating the likes of Jay Heron, Douglas Lima, and Andre Koreshkov. By July 2013, he was 12-0 and after not getting his chance in the UFC, headed to Asia and won championships where in his second fight, he fought the champion Nobutatsu Suzuki and then TKO'd him in under two minutes. Yeah, he got finishes as well. For the next three years, he defended his one title until he beat Shinya Aoki in under one minute and retired at 18-0, an undefeated, long-reigning and defending champion in two major organizations. Absolutely something to be proud of. He kind of left the door open and stated the only fight he wanted was George St. Pierre, and after one year of retirement, Dana finally relented and he was traded with the UFC and won for Demetrius Johnson. He narrowly got past Robbie Lawler in his UFC debut, but after a tirade of trash talk faced Jorge Masvidal at UFC 239. Ben was 19-0, still undefeated after 10 years of being a pro in MMA, but in just five seconds that all came to a shocking end when he was on the receiving end of the fastest KO in UFC history and a flying knee straight from Cuba. He was memed into oblivion when he finally got to the big show, but amongst the hardcores, you can't deny that initial 18-0 legacy. I just want to give a big, big shout out to the official fuel of MMA on point, Jocko Fuel. The boys are back to offer you 10% off their pre-workout. It's got healthy levels of caffeine paired with theanine to support a balanced stimulant experience and citrulline and theobromine, which helps promote sustainable muscle pump and stamina. So get you 10% off using the code MMA on point, And with your subscription, you can get free shipping and you can stock up on your fuel at originmain.com slash Jocko Fuel for the ultimate boost and go on living your best life. Big shout out to my man Lawton for editing today's video. Jump on over to Twitter and follow him at Lawton underscore Veercam. Shout out to Ben Rosette and the excellent music he provided during the intro video. His music can be found on streaming platforms everywhere. There is a link in the description and follow him at Ben Rosette on Instagram and on Twitter. Thank you very much for watching everyone today. Please go ahead and like and subscribe if you did enjoy the content. We upload at least three videos every week for your viewing pleasure. Go ahead and leave a comment below if you want to join in the discussion and follow us on Twitter at MMA on point and myself at Balian underscore plays. You can now jump in and join the community discord as well if you want to continue the discussion further and I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. I'll see you in the next one.